extremity and a lot of injuries are affected with uh, with uh, with sports affecting the sh shoulder joint and so here as usual i would like to uh, always start with this one with a text from the bible in isaiah 40 30 and 31 uh, saying even the youth shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings as eagles they shall run and not be weary and they shall walk and not faint so uh, in spite of our skill there's always some limitations that we have to expect when we treat patients and it's not only us but uh, we need somebody from above so the learning objectives of this uh, presentation is that uh, we are able to understand the complex anatomy of the shoulder joint and its related structures using different application of ultrasound, identify the different structures of the shoulder joint and its relationship with other related structures by using dynamic ultrasound techniques, apply the different techniques maneuvers in simplifying the visualization of complex, stru complex structures of the shoulder using ultrasound, and then, of course, uh, describe the different approaches using ultrasound and imaging, musculoskeletal, peripheral nerves, and other related structures. Introduce interventional approaches involving the shoulder joint in a safe, convenient, and effective way using ultrasound guidance. And describe limitations and advantages of ultrasound as compared to other modalities in the diagnosis of clinical conditions in the shoulder. So with this in mind, let us weave through the shoulder joint. So uh, my presentation will include four areas. So the first one will be discussing prim primarily the rot rotator cuff pathology. And then of course, you will include shoulder bursa, recess and joints. Then you will include joint capsule. Then you will include ultrasound guided interventional procedures. So why is there a need for ultrasound for the shoulder? So primarily the reason for this is it's portable, it's quick, available and reliable, it's safe, it's convenient, and it's accurate. And uh, the learning curve, however, is uh, steep and costly, but this is also user dependent. So if you have a good background of, uh, of ultrasound, then at least uh, you can actually uh, be better in terms of diagnosing it and uh, uh, more exposure your your skill is uh, being developed and then of course this is the only modality with dynamic imaging you can visualize all soft tissue layers and a good alternative for patients with metal implants and those with contraindications for mri and uh, ct scans for that matter so rotator cuff so we know that the rotator cuff are the muscles that uh, usually uh, control the mobility of the shoulder and we know that this is composed of four basic muscles. We have the supraspinatus from the superior portion, which is uh, superior and posteriorly. And then we have your infraspinatus. Then, of course, uh, towards the lower portion, we have the teres minor. So this holds the shoulder in the posterior and superior portion of the shoulder. And then, of course, uh, we have the one anteriorly, which is not seen uh in its entirety in the ultrasound because most of the the parts of the of this muscle is covered by the scapula so this is your subscapularis but of course uh, we see a portion of that at the tendinous insertion in the lesser tuberosity of the of the humerus so uh the ultrasound appearance of course is that uh, if you are dealing with tendons of course the pattern of uh, image is that it is usually hyperechoic, it's fibrillar, and uh, it is the one that is closely attached to the bone at the bony cortex. And so we see this to be uh, very echogenic. And uh, the transition from tendon to muscles, of course, uh, is uh, a portion where part of the muscle becomes uh, hyperechoic and starry starry night in pattern. So it's usually that uh, area in the transition period, which is also affected by any uh, tear or abnormality in the, in the tendon. Of course, not in the case of the supraspinatus, of course. And then of course, the bony cortex 
is usually hyperechoic. And of course, uh, it's, it's very nice to use this as a reference because uh, this is the one that you can see to be very, very echogenic. And so if you use this as your marker, then you can see the contour of the bone and then the relationship of this bone to the tendon and of course the muscle and the other structures surrounding it. Now, uh, the supraspinatus, of course, is divided into different facets. So we have the superior facet, which is occupied by the supraspinatus, as you can see. Uh, most of the area that is on top of the superior facet is made up of your supraspinatus. And of course, as you go uh, scan this area, you will, you will realize that there is a pointed portion of the humerus, which is actually the junction between the spear and middle facet. And it is interesting to notice that this junction is actually made up of an overlap between your infraspinatus and the supraspinatus. Of course, much of that area is occupied by the supraspinatus, but as you can see, this, there is really an overlap of the supra and the infraspinatus. And of course, down below, you have your inferior facet. And of course, towards the midline, you can see the bicep tendon in its short axis. So as we proceed here, this is, this is how the supraspinatus insertion is really uh, shown. And then the fibers, the fibers is really inserted by layers up to the uh, facet by which it inserts into the greater tuberosity. And then uh, the fibers are arranged in such a way that uh, when one layer is affected, not every layer could be damaged actually because the fibers are just following the, the, the you, would, you would call it as a, a pinnate arrangement of the muscle. So as you can see here in the drawing that the insertion is right at the greater tuberosity. And then of course, there is that uh, point wherein there is a junction also of the articular portion of the joint and the insertion of the tendon by the supraspinatus uh, insertion. Now uh, here, uh, this is uh, a dynamic imaging of the subscapularis. Of course, the subscapularis is just underneath the poracoid process towards the midline, and it is really inserted at the lesser tuberosity of the humerus. Uh, it's not working, the dynamic uh, image is not working anyway. But uh, as you try to internally, externally rotate the upper extremity in the, with the flexed elbow and an adapted shoulder, as you rotate that, you can see the subscapularis moving out from the Poracoid process below that portion. And of course, you can see on top of that, of course, would be your uh, bursa, your subdeltoid bursa. And then, as you will discuss later on, there are other bursa beneath your uh, subcoracoid and also beneath that junction between your uh, humerus and, of course, your poracoid process. We will discuss it a little later. And then, of course, we have also the infraspinatus which is located posteriorly. And the surprisingly, this is a very good reference that they are using to actually uh, decide whether a tear in the supraspinatus could, could be substituted by the presence of the infraspinatus, just in case they, they did a surgery of the subscapularis, of the supraspinatus, I should say. So normally the ratio is two, for infraspinatus and one for teres minor. So we have a two is the one ratio. So you can see that the size of the infraspinatus is really large, twice as large as the size of the teres minor. Now you, you try to see this in the short axis from the spine of the scapula, you scan the, 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 the muscle down. And the first muscle that you can see is your infraspinatus. Then of course I should go towards the lateral side as you kind of rotate obliquely your throat towards the side, you can also see the teres minor. And then in between the teres minor and the infraspinatus, there is a kind of a hump. There is a hump. That, that hump will indicate that 
you are already passing uh, beyond the infraspinatus and the next muscle after that would be your uh, teres minor. So this is very important in order to see if the muscle can actually hold the, the joints if there is a surgery being done in the supraspinatus. Now another part of the shoulder that is also very important is the rotator cuff interval. As you can see here, it's made up of a lot of other structures. So you can see on the medial side, the subscapularis, and towards the lateral side, you can see the supraspinatus. And at the middle side, you can see the biceps tendon. But you also will see that on top of the biceps tendon is the ligament, which is called your curacohumeral ligament. Now, if, if you will notice, the biceps tendon is found at the bicipital groove. And there is also a ligament right on top of that area, which we sometimes attribute to be the one that holds the biceps tendon to stabilize it from moving out of that uh, groove, which is the transverse ligament. But in reality, the one that really holds that and stabilizes that is actually the paracohumeral ligament. So that any injury on that particular ligament can also affect the mobility of the biceps tendon um, back and forth on the bicipital groove. So the paracohumeral ligament is a very important structure that we can also see and check as we put our shoulder in uh, adapted position with a flexed elbow and uh, in the position the probe is uh, transverse and then we can go up and down just to be able to, fit, to, to see the details of the parochial ligament. So this ligament, unless there is a massive tear of the supraspinatus, could not be torn easily. But for patients that has a massive injury, of the of the supraspinatus, this ten, this ligament could also be secondarily affected. Okay, so here uh, most of the diagnosis actually could be attributed or could be started to be seen in this area. So uh, I would I would say diagnosis should be started at the rotator cuff interval. If we would like to see any pathology of whatever rotator cuff muscle would like to see, because here you can see already the uh, subscapularis and supraspinatus. Uh, if you move it laterally and towards the medial side, and you can see the biceps and in the middle. So if there's any pathology there, you can already see. You can also see the, uh, as I've said, the parochial ligament just on top of the biceps tendon. So you can. Uh, scan that back and forth, back and forth, in order to see if there's any pathology in that area, much like the one that is shown here in the positioning of the uh, patient uh, in the modified cross procedure, or in, in fact, in this case, the cross uh, maneuver. So the details here that you can see is that uh, aside from the uh, humeral ligament, there are other ligaments that are also found here. The superior glenohumeral ligament, as you can see, is also found uh, along this uh, plane, just uh, almost close to your uh, parochial ligament, and it is between your uh, subscapularis, and then of course your long head of the bicep stand. And so, uh, in order to see that, you can also change your direction or your plane of uh, visualization so that you will be able to see. But you can start with this short axis first, and then you can go long axis and try to see if there's any pathology also in the particular tendon. Although the most commonly affected really is your parochial ligament, if there's a massive tear in your uh, supraspinatus. The other thing that is very interesting here is the superior complex band. Now, how do you visualize this? Now, if you're already in a in a modified cross maneuver position. All you have to do is for you to really see the, the superior complex is for you to push the elbow more posteriorly so that the, the elbow plane or the upper extremity plane is parallel to the side of the trunk. So you almost push the elbow very posteriorly in, in a modified 
modified cross positioning. Now, if you maintain the probe in a short axis, you will notice that there is an echogenic uh, portion of the shoulder that appears below your infra and supraspinatus, and that is what you call the superior complex band. Now, the superior complex band is actually a cylindrical band that is formed by the contribution by the different muscle uh, architecture. The, some of them are coming from your infraspinatus, some of them comes from your supraspinatus, and some of them also are contributed by the coracohumeral ligament on both sides. So as you can see, this is a very thick structure. And the reason why uh, this is very important is because when we would try to diagnose a massive tear of the supraspinatus, it is nice to check this part of the superior complex because if there is really a massive tear that requires surgery, this, is, this area will also be torn as well. So it's not only the upper portion that you see, the infra and the supraspinatus, but you will see that on the lower portion, which is actually between your articular cartilage and your tendon of the supraspinatus, the thick band there, is what we call the superior complex band. And uh, the tear in that area would also indicate that there is really a very bad tear on the shoulder. So here again is another uh, representation. This is a, a case from the scanning of Dr. Martinoli. So you can see here that uh, the red portion is infraspinatus, the blue portion is the supraspinatus, and the band is really covering both the area below your infra and your supraspinatus. And as I have mentioned earlier, it is made up of the different contributions from different structures around the shoulder. And uh, this is really a very important structure that you need to see if you wanted to uh, kind of look at if there is any tear massive tear in the uh, rotator cuff uh, muscle. Now, another thing is, uh, is the rotator cable. Rotator cable is uh, part also of the band that we have just mentioned. And this one is actually a condensation of ligaments in the rotator cuff interval, which is primarily made of your coracohumeral ligament. The thickness is measured to be 1.2 millimeters and the width is about 4.5 millimeters. Again, that almost uh, is sometimes interchangeably used to call also this uh, uh, the superior complex band and of course uh, the rotator cable. So most of the time, these two structures are interchangeably used and that is fine because they are actually related to each other. Now rotator cuff tear, okay, here, uh, as we can notice, uh, we classify shoulder pathology in terms of whether it's the full thickness of the tendon or just part of it. If it's a full thickness, in other words, there is a pathology from top to bottom. So from the bursal side, up to the articular side, it is uh, torn. Uh, the, the entire thickness is torn. And then if we say it's partial thickness, it could be bursal side thickness or uh, thickness tears, or it could be the articular sided thickness tears. Now, as you have noticed here, I try to compare the sensitivity of the different modality. For example, MRI and ultrasound are almost it's the same in terms of sensitivity, 92 to 95 percent, if you are using it to diagnose full thickness tears. But of course, uh, MRA is more specific. For partial thickness, MRA is more sensitive, 86 percent. And if you will compare MRI and ultrasound, you will notice that ultrasound is superior to uh, MRI in diagnosing partial thickness tears of the rotator cuff. And then uh, we have here also a comparison between ultrasound and arthroscopy for full thickness tears. And we have a sensitivity of 100%, a specificity of 85%.
positive predictive value of 96% and negative peak value of 100% and an accuracy of about 96%. So if you're using ultrasound, we're safe. We, we can use it with uh, confidence because we know that we can actually diagnose tears uh, the way other modalities can diagnose it. Of course, we have also uh, different uh, areas here by which we can uh, diagnose. So here, let's say if you are dealing with the articular or borsal side tear, so you can see here that there is a connection between the joint and the tendon. So there is a communication between that area. But if we say it's borsal side, the communication is between your bursa and of course your tendon. Then if we say it's full thickness, then there is that communication from bursa to articular side and the tear is through and through. But if we say complete, the full width of the tendon is really torn. Now, I just would like to highlight here something that may be very, uh, should I say, we, we, we kind of missed it uh, to some extent because we also use this as a way of diagnosing uh, rotator cuff tear. For example, uh, we are using indirect signs. And one of the indirect signs is cortical irregularity. Now, uh, there are a lot of studies that says that cortical irregularity can only apply as an indirect sign for supraspinatus. And it could not apply to subscapularis or other tendons or other shoulders. So I just want to be clear that this is only applicable to supraspinatus. Then other indirect signs, of course, are volume loss, then the presence of effusion. In other words, there is a connection between the bursa or the joint and the tear itself. And of course, the cartilage interface sign. And of course, if there is a massive tear, as I mentioned earlier, you have to check for the rotator cable or the uh, complex band that is just below your supraspinatus in order to see if that structure is also involved. Now here, just to differentiate how is tendon tear differentiated to tendinosis. So tear is anechoic, tendinosis is hypoechoic, tear is well-defined, tendinosis is ill-defined. Tear is homogeneous, tendinosis is heterogeneous. Then tear is thinned, so in other words, you, can, you cannot anymore see anything in between. And tendinosis is usually swollen. And then in tear, there is bony irregularity, while in tendinosis, there is a smooth cortex. So just for us to be guided as to how we should differentiate those two, two diagnoses. So here, this is a full thickness tear of the supraspinatus. And you can see that there is nothing in between the bursa and the articular side. So it is all continuous. There's nothing there except for the connective tissue in between part of the, uh, of course, the uh, articular cartilage that is hyperechoic. Then, of course, on top of that is the bursa, which where there is really nothing there except for the uh, anechoic portion of the tear that has already retracted in a long axis view. Here is another view, of course, of the supraspinatus in the short axis. And you say the same thing, it's also confirmed by uh, MRI. And uh, the same thing is present, nothing in between your bursa, your articulation, of course, your uh, tendon on that area, which is affected. So uh, another thing here is uh, when we use another indirect sign for tear, like your cartilage interface sign, we only use it for articular tear. So as you can see, if there is nothing in between, then the probe gets into that spot where there is nothing in between the articular side, it kind of reflect back. And that is what you see as the cartilage interface sign, because there's nothing in between the joint and of course the tendon that has disappeared because of the tear. So we call it the cartilage interface sign. So these are articular sided tear. So articular sided tear or the full yard actually represent damage to the superior complex rather than 
to our rotator tendon themselves. So it's always important that we we really hyper uh, in, in, increase the you push the elbow more posteriorly in the short axis to be able to see if there is any superior band still present. And usually you don't see that structure anymore. So there is really a massive tear in the uh, part of the shoulder. Now this one is uh, the bursal partial thickness tear. And then as you can see, there is a thickened bursa and the thickened bursa communicates with the tendon uh, right uh, in the middle of the supraspinatus. So this one is not directly communicating with the, with the articular portion of the shoulder. And so we say this is just a borsal partial thickness there. And then of course, we have also uh, an intrasubstance there that there is just located in the mid portion of the, of the supraspinatus. And as you can see here, there are no cartilage interface sign. So in, in an intrasubstance there, it's, it's not present here. As I mentioned earlier, it is only found in an articular sided tear of the supraspinatus. Now I would like to, uh, this is from Dr. Martinoli, we call it the partial articular surface tendon abulsion, or what we sometimes call just a rim rent tear. And a rim rent tear is a kind of articular sided tear but it's very interesting because it is right at the insertion of the articular side tendon of the supraspinatus. And that is the reason why they call it the rim rent, just that area in the rim of the uh, tendon. And they call it the partial articular surface tendon abortion. This is found usually in overhead activities in the athletes. And sometimes uh, they, the force during the end phase of the throwing uh, movement of the athlete is where is when where the tear really happens so if we do not treat them they can convert into a full thickness tears or if it is all, only at the affecting the insertion in the bone itself where the bone is actually avulsed then we call it the bony pasta because there is a partial avulsion of the bony footprint of the supraspinatus with no disruption of the tendon fibers. So this is a, a very interesting case. If you would like to be very specific in describing our uh, sub, 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 supraspinatus there. And there's also one that is called the paint lesion. This is the partial articular tear with intratendinous extension and uh, this one is much like the intersubstance there. So here it also is seen usually among throwing athletes and fibers at the margins of the tear delaminates on a horizontal line. So it's almost like uh, an intersubstance tear except that it is very long. So they call this type of lesion the paint lesion. So for tendinosis, as we mentioned earlier, it is usually swollen. And as you can see here, it's heterogeneous. It's swollen and it affects a particular area in the tendon. And in this case, this one is really a, a supraspinatus tendinosis. Now let's go to fatty infiltration and muscle atrophy. Uh, as I had mentioned earlier, there is uh, the the infraspinatus teres minor ratio is normally two is to one, and it is usually seen in a short axis view when we scan from the scapula of the spine down to the lower portion, and it is directed towards the oblique the oblique lateral. So we would see the the groove or the hump in between your infraspinatus and the teres minor, and of course. Uh, this one is very uh, important in order to, to see whether uh, there is a change in the echogenicity of the infraspinatus and if there is any problem in terms of innervation, for example, or there is an atrophy 
then what we see is really a fatty infiltration. Usually this is echogenic. This is really uh, more white than black, okay? So in that case, uh, this is really a fatty infiltration. So normally, if you measure the uh, infraspinatus and trace minor with the hump, you can see the hump in between the infra and the, and the teres minor, the ratio, as I've said, is two is to one. But as it approximates one is to one, uh, the surgeon has to think again whether he has to pursue the procedure of doing surgery or not. Because most often, if you proceed the surgery with a ratio of one is to one, the infraspinatus is not able to hold the and support the shoulder when a surgery is being undertaken. So this is a very good guide to be able to know if there is uh, any, uh, uh, if the muscle is able to support that, that particular uh, injury. Then on the right side of the screen, you can see here that there is a fat infiltration. It's echogenic, but at the same time, there is an atrophy in the infraspinatus. So if you see this, this uh, image, then you can see that it's either a uh, denervation or it's it could be caused by uh, an injury in the past that has denervated or it could just be a muscle atrophy that has happened over time. So again, this is another picture of the fatty infiltration. You can see the uh, echogenicity of the, of the fats on the infra, infraspinatus as compared to the teres minor. Of course, uh, the, the, the innervation is different no? for, uh, for infospinatus, it's the suprascapular nerve, and of course, uh, the axillary nerve for the teres minor. So, PERS here is uh, what's for hyperechoic synovium, which may appear similar to tendon fibers in the subacronus of the opioid borsa. And of course, hyperechoic thickness extending at a greater tuberosity is. Um, subacronous deltoid balls, tiny calf fibers, and bisubstantial sheet effusion is connected with subacronous deltoid dorsal distension, but also at the same time it is connected with a linear humeral joint. And so, if you have uh, a fluid in this area that has a 95% positive predictive value for rotator cuff tears, cortical irregularity with a shaped tears only applies to supraspinatus tendon, we know that, and infraspinatus atrophy is the best guide in determining the success of rotator cuff surgery. And cartilage interface sign is applicable only to articular sided tear. So here, let's go to the bursa. The shoulder has a lot of bursa. And so we need to really know exactly where those bursas are located and how they communicate with each other. Now, if you look at this drawing, this is a diagrammatic drawing, the subacromial subdeltoid bursa is actually connected to your glenohumeral joint. And any fluid that goes to the subacromial subdeltoid bursa could also go to the glenohumeral joint, but at the same time, it could also go to your bicep standard sheath. But the other, for example, the subscapular recess and subcoracoid bursa are independent from each other. And so if there's any fluid going into that area, that means there's a tear that has happened somewhere. And usually it is a tear of the supraspinatus that could also extend to where these bursas are located. So it's very important to, to realize that this bursa could give us a clue as to exactly where the fluid is coming from and what is the pathology that is happening in the shoulder joint. So let's take a look at the subacromial subdelta bursa. So this is very thin and under normal circumstances, I shouldn't see them quite clearly because it's very thin. And uh, the only thing that you can see are the walls, which is hyperechoic with a periborsal sac purpose of fat and the thickness is usually one more than one millimeter thick and the fluid is usually anechoic and if there is any hyper 
or there should be an inflammation of that area, there could be some changes in the synovial area. And that is the reason why sometimes it becomes thicker or it could be echogenic in a way because it has thickened over time. So fluid accumulate in this area at the most dependent portion. So where is that located? So the most dependent portion actually is at the lateral portion of the shoulder. That is where your subacranial subdural is. So if you scan your shoulder, let's say you're looking for uh, the lateral portion, the supraspinatus at the lateral side of the, of the shoulder, then you can go down a, uh, a bit downwards in order to see if there is a fluid accumulating in that area, which we sometimes call the teardrop sign, because that is where the first flu a sign of fluid is accumulated, because that's a very dependent portion of the supraspinatus delta dorsa. You might not see it up there in the shoulder, but as you scan down laterally, then you will be able to see like in this uh, scan here at the right lower portion, that's the fluid. There's no fluid up there, but the fluid is right there. That is a teardrop sign. That means there's really a fluid. There should be no fluid there under normal circumstances. Now, this is a pathology that uh, we, we sometimes see, and this could occupy the bursa. And this is very painful, and usually, if you try to palpate the area of pain, the patient will usually scream. And this is the only case wherein a patient would really uh, yell when you touch it because this particular uh, calcium deposit is really, really painful. And if you try to be on guided aspiration of it, you don't need to really aspirate the syringe actively because the pressure inside the bursa would be the one to push the fluid out. And usually, in my experience, the moment I get rid of this uh, calcium deposit, the patient will experience a dramatic relief of pain because that particular uh, calcium deposit is the one that's causing pain in that side of the shoulder. So uh, this one can also stay in the bursa and cause so much pain. Now, the other one is, of course, the subcoracoid bursa. And if you look at it, it's just underneath the coracoid. So sometimes you don't appreciate this a lot because it's lower, the, it's lower than the subscapular recess. The recess is towards the lateral side and more superior, but this one is actually more, uh, more inferior and more medial. So this is also a medial extension of the subacromial subdural bursa in most cases. So if there is a fluid that may be coming from a tear that may affect the subacromial subdural bursa, it could extend towards the subcoracoid bursa. And so you can also see, you can only appreciate this if you in externally rotate your shoulder when you try to uh, focus the, the probe below the, uh, the coracoid process. And so that is where you, you need to put the probe uh, on that area. Uh, this one doesn't communicate with the glenohumeral joint, as we mentioned earlier, and does not change with internal, external rotation, and does not have an inverted U shape over the subscapularis. So this is more medial than it is more lateral. Now, the other one is, of course, your subscapular recess. As I have mentioned, this is more superior as compared to your subcoracoid bursa. And this is a normal extension of the glenohumeral joint. So uh, if, if the biceps tendon sheath could have fluid, it could point to uh, a problem in the glenohumeral joint. So in the same way, this could also uh, be an extension but this is not usually a normal extension because not most this is not a very uh dependent portion of the shoulder so if you would like to check first the fluid that comes from the the joint you have to go through the one that i've shown you in the teardrop sign that's where you can also uh check that part but here this one is actually located more 
medially. And in order to really see this, you have to scan a little downwards and, and you have to slowly do an external interpretation to be able to, to see this uh, kind of recess. It extends also below the, the coracoid and above the subscapularis muscle. So the three main recesses of the glenoidal joint, of course, are your biceps tendon sheath that is communicating with your glenoidal joint, the posterior recess, and posteriorly, we have your axillary recess to be the one that is most dependent. And of course, anteriorly, the anterior recess made up of the subscapular recess of the lever of the labrum, and I've said just below also uh, medially, or should I say laterally, uh, of the coracoid process. Now, the fluid in the biceps tendon sheath, which is actually the extension of the glenoidal joint, will collect around the biceps tendon. And this is almost seen in 97% if there is a joint diffusion. So uh, don't be bothered if you have any fluid in that area. It doesn't mean that you have a biceps uh, inflammation. It may just be because of the joint itself. Now, what about if it's really the biceps uh, tendon synovitis without any connection with the joint? So here, there will be a focal distension. So the, the biceps itself is swollen. If you put a power Doppler, you can see a hyperemia in that area. And then, of course, if you try to do sonopalpation, there will be pain and tenderness in that area. And then, of course, there is no effusion in the posterior recess. So this thing here, if you see this pattern, then it is pointing really to a pathology of the biceps tendon uh, separate from the one that is coming from your glenohumeral joint. Then, of course, uh, we have already mentioned this, the anterior recess. Now, let's go now to your capsule because a lot of times I know that most of you are seeing a lot of uh, uh, adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder. And sometimes it's very interesting how you can actually diagnose it by means of ultrasound. So if you look at this uh, drawing, uh, this is by Dr. Martinoli, you will notice that the capsule completely surrounds the joint, except for a little portion of the superior area of the joint. And so you can actually see this capsule at the axillary area, or you can see it right in front, just uh, very close to the subscapular tendon, and you can actually measure it. And so if there is any pathology with that structure, then you can tell that you may, the patient may be suffering from a certain kind of capsulitis. So here, uh, I, this is uh, a measurement of uh, the capsule right at the axilla, and normally it should be one millimeter in thickness. So that's the hyperechoic portion just above the uh, joint articular articulation is the capsule, the pathogenic part, then you can measure it. It's usually one millimeter. Anything that is more than one millimeter is considered uh, capsulitis. So again, here you can also uh, see the capsule here. If you externally rotate the shoulder and you are looking at the subscapularis, for example, what you will notice is that the insertion of the subscapularis tendon is just the one that is found at the mid portion, which is the number uh, two here. And then, of course, if you go and move it more externally, you will notice that in the drawing below, you can see the white portion that is the postocondal surface, that is, the, that is where the capsule is located. And you can also measure it from the point anteriorly, looking at it at, in the short axis view. So the one that we've shown you uh, a little earlier was the one in the axilla, and this one is the, the one at the anterior portion. And again, the same one millimeter that is considered normal, and anything that is beyond one millimeter is uh, uh, considered to be uh, abnormal. So here, this is another way of doing it in the 
and the anterior portion. So as you can see here, this is a clear view of uh, what we are trying to measure. Okay, this is an extreme external rotation. Then you can see the, the capsule there. You can measure it. And then uh, anything that is more than one millimeter is considered to be uh, a capsule. So your frozen shoulder, I, I don't know if we can still do it with, with the frozen shoulder, but uh, you can try to externally rotate. I know it's limited, but this one may be an accessible part because if you also check the one that is in the axilla, it's even more, more difficult. So this one is uh, uh, a measurement of the capsule uh, comparing the thickness of the normal capsule and the one that is really thickened. So as you can see here, it's very thick in the affected, affected area compared with the one that is normal. So you can go uh, side to side comparison of the capsule in order to see if there's any problem with the thickness of the capsule. How about impingements? Now there's a lot also of impingements that we can see in the shoulder. And uh, the more common, of course, is your subacromial impingement where you can actually see a redundancy of the delt, uh, subdeltoid bursa and subacromial bursa as you try to abduct the shoulder with your probe on the lateral side of the acromion on the shoulder. Now, most of the time, it could be caused by a joint intensified, or it could be just the weakness of the muscle to a point where it becomes redundant or it could be associated with tendon tear, degeneration, and tear itself. So there could be so many reasons for the impingement. But it's good to see to do a dynamic uh, imaging. This is supposed to be a dynamic imaging, but it's not working. Okay, other things that we do is, of course, ultrasound guided interventional procedure. And this is, uh, I will not uh, discuss this lengthily because some, somebody else will discuss this in the future. but. Uh, there are a lot of solutions that you can use. You can use dextrose water, as was discussed yesterday. You can use steroid injection. And then uh, the most important thing that we have to emphasize here is that it is always best to do an ultrasound-guided interventional procedures because of the better way of targeting sites that you can use when you do it under ultrasound guidance. So these are different uh, studies pointing to the advantage of doing a ultrasound guided injection as compared to just palpation guided injection. So when you compare the accuracy here, let's say you are injecting different sites in the joint, AC joint or glenohumeral joint, comparing ultrasound, palpation and fluoroscopy, you can see a very uh, wide difference. Uh, let's say glenohumeral joint, 95%, ultrasound fluoroscopy 70%, subacromial subdelta of course 100%, for fluoroscopy 60%, palpation is 63%. So if you are injecting a particular solution, it would be best to use a guided ultrasound procedure to be able to deliver the, the solution very well to the sites. This is a subscapillary tendon injection. Again, this is, uh, okay, it's not working again. So this is also hydride section of the nerve, okay? So uh, it's not also working. Anyway, uh, the point here is that when we do an injection by ultrasound guided, it is always uh, accurate in the sense that we can see the target, we can see the needle, we can see where the solution is going. And so it would, help us identify specific areas that uh, you would like to deliver the solution. So it's always best that we do an ultrasound guided injection. This one is uh, ultrasound guided posterior glenohumeral joint injection in plain approach. Uh, of course, uh, the approach is from lateral to medial. Okay, as you can see, I'm puncturing the infraspinatus towards the articular area. I am trying to avoid actually the labrum because I don't want to injure the labrum here. So this is another one. This is actually an anterior linear joint injection of the plane. So uh, this is a video, but uh, 
this is not also working. So let me just end with a case. This is a 64 year, 62 year old male from Cebu, Philippines. He injured himself from a fall on his left shoulder when he was pulling up uh, in an iron bar. Okay, can you imagine a 62 year old pulling up? Uh, I was asking him, why did you do that? And he said uh, he was destroying himself if he can still do it. Anyway, he fell and there was pain over the lateral deltoid, pain on extremes of motion. There is a negative empty contest. There is an atrophy, as you can see, over the supra-infospinatus fossa on the left side. If you look at the picture, you can see a marked uh, atrophy of that muscle on, on this uh, side on the left compared to the one on the right. Now, I did a scan of this muscle, and this is what I saw in the biceps. So there is fluid, and you can also see that there is actually a rupture of the coracohumeral ligament. As you will notice in the short head, short axis view of the biceps, the biceps is already going to the medial side, and it has already subluxated actually more than the greater, uh, should I say, the lesser tuberosity. And so I would assume that the, the coracohumeral ligament is ruptured in this case. And then if you look at the long axis view, you will also notice that there is fluid in the uh, biceps tendon sheath. And so there could be an injury. It could be coming from the supraspinatus tendon or it could be coming from the joint itself. As we have mentioned, if there is a problem with the tendon, in the case, it could also affect the, the fluid going to the biceps, really what happened. Can now, we, see, uh, we see here in the previous picture a tear inside the biceps tendon, long in the biceps tendon, there is a tear inside the previous picture, Ayo, this one. Uh, would you like to see this one? There is tear inside the tendon and the uh, added view. Yeah, this is a, a coracohumeral ligament tear on the short axis view. This is the biceps. This is actually the bicep, the short head, the biceps on the left, the long head of the biceps on the right. Okay, and of course, the deltoid. For the, uh, for the axial view of the long head of biceps tendon, inside the tendon, there is a hypoechoic. Yes, there is also, there is also some kind of a tear in the middle of the bicep tendon, you will notice there is that uh, uh, hypoechoic or anechoic uh, linear uh, tear in, in, in the middle of the bicep tendon. So here I take a look at the supraspinatus, and this is what I see. So the left affected is almost gone, nothing. The, the tendon has retracted. This is the normal right. And uh, as we proceed along, okay, there is fluid in the axillary recess as compared with the normal right here. So uh, it's been several months from the time of injury. And then I kind of measure the thickness of the infraspinatus and the teres minor, and this is what I saw. So if you will notice here, the thickness of the infraspinatus to teres minor on the left, the affected left, is almost equal. In fact, uh, the teres minor is even thicker than the teres minor. And because he was asking me if it would be a good idea to do surgery. So I tried to check this area, and uh, I told him, I think if I have to advise you, I don't want you to undergo any surgery. Actually, the patient is a, is a physician. So he, he would understand exactly the consequence of that procedure if ever he would do that. So, okay, so if eventually I did not do anything. I just examined him. I, I, I'm suggesting to do some rehabilitation uh, program for him. Uh, but since he's already 60 years old, he said uh, he will just uh, continue his exercise in his clinic. So I said, but surgery, I, I won't advise you to do any surgery. 
because uh, of this uh, finding. So prognosis-wise, uh, normally there is a 2 to 1 ratio of the intraspinatus teres minor muscle. In this case, there is a, a ratio of less than 1 is to 1 for infraspinatus teres minor muscle. So surgical surgery is not viable for this patient. And then after an injury, patient has to decide before three weeks as to whether to do surgery or not. Because uh, in all the papers, it says that uh, surgery could be ideally done within the three week period after the injury. But if you do it after that, then the prognosis is poor. So again, thank you very much. And uh, I really appreciate you for staying, <laughs> staying in spite of the fact that Dr. Ingrid Muller could not make it because of uh, problems with uh, his uh, uh, Zoom application. So I would like to know if uh, you have any question or you have any comments or do you want to add anything? Thank you for staying. I know I have uh, maybe wasted one hour of your time just uh, waiting for our first lecture a while ago. But the question, I have one question if you yeah. allow yes, me. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. For, for calcific tendinitis of the sovraspinatus, uh, tendon and muscle. When I uh, try to inject saline and aspirate through the syringe, usually uh, fluid does not come back. On uh, that is calcific uh, calcific tendinitis. Okay, and then when you inject, are you doing it ultrasound guided? Yes. And then. It's not coming out? It, it doesn't come out. Fluid goes inside the muscle or the tendon, and you cannot uh, get it back. OK, usually there are different stages of the calcium deposit. If, you, uh, if it's a very early stage, usually the calcium is very hard yet. It's very hard. It's very, it's, uh, I would say, uh, it almost resembles that of a bone. Uh, and and if you look at it, there is uh, it's it's very thick. And usually, if you do injection at that at that point, you would not be able to really uh, extract anything. So I would advise that you wait a little while until that calcium uh, resolve. And usually, when the calcium is resolved, the appearance of the calcium deposit becomes isoechoic. It almost resembles that of the tendon. You, you can hardly see the difference. Although, uh, before it transitions to that point, you can also check it uh, intermittently. And when it becomes, re uh, it has resolved already, then if you actually puncture it with your needle, it will just go out very smoothly. But the reason that maybe you are not getting it yet is because it, it, it was on the initial stage, so it, it's very hard. It's very hard. It should eventually resolve, and as it resolves, it would be more of a liquid. So if you puncture it, then you don't need to really uh, exert a lot of effort. It will just flow out easily. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jim. Dr. Jim, there's a question here yes. from Byron Garcia. Byron, would you want to ask your question? Okay, so maybe if Byron is unable to ask the question, I'll ask uh, it for him. So, for the case presented, this is the one, Byron. Will that patient yes. benefit from uh, PIT? Uh, of yes. Course. Of course, of course. Uh, um, uh, this patient does not really present with much pain. In fact, when he, he came to my office, uh, he can actually move his arms. There's no much limitation because it's not a complete tear. It's, it's just a full thickness tear. It's not really complete. So he can still move it because there are still fibers that remains there. But I was just cautioning him not to uh, undergo really surgery because his uh, infospinosis is very atrophic. But on the question of will PIT or orthobiologic uh, uh, benefit, will it benefit now the the literature would not be very pleasant for orthobiologics, but for PIT, yes. For PIT, I would go for it, but for PRP, maybe you're saying PRP orthobiologics, 
this would not respond because this is a complete tear. Or this is a full thickness tear, I should say. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Jean. There's another question from Dr. Siddiqui. Um, uh, is there a difference? Can you differentiate the um, cartilage interface sign also with? Huh? Okay, are you reading that uh, interface sign and the double contour sign as in the case of an ankle pathology? Okay, usually if you look at the cartilage interface sign, there is a hypoechoic to an echoic shadow on top of that. That means there is really nothing in between the joint where the cartilage is and the pair that is close to the articular side. That's why you call it cartilage interface sign because it, has, it is actually just reflecting back the image when there is something that is empty right there. And most of the time that, that is uh, due to the fluid in the tendon that is in between your tendon and your uh, cartilage. And it is reflected back as a cartilage interface sign. Now, if you're asking about the double contour sign, the double contour sign would be much different because you will notice two lines right on top of the articular cartilage. You can really see the two lines, but uh, this is not always seen until such time that your, uh, that your uric acid level would be twice the normal. In other words, if you have a, a uric acid that is uh, only a little higher than the normal, it would not show. But the moment it is twice the normal level of the uric acid, then you can see this cartilage interface sign as uh, an indication that you're dealing with a gouty arthritis. And you usually see this a lot in the knee and also in the ankle, especially at the first MTP. Did I answer your question? I think, I think so, Dr. Jim. Thank you so much. Dr. Jim, I have a question. Considering that this is an advanced ultrasound, you know, um, uh, lecture, are there any other maneuver other than the CRAS and the modified CRAS so that we can um, see or uh, visualize the shoulder better other than just the CRAS or the modified CRAS? You can always do uh, certain modifications in the shoulder depending on what structure you're looking at. But for the purpose of uh, standardizing the movements and looking at the same structures that we'd like to see, especially the one that I've shown you, uh, we would use the brass or modified brass to be able to see the rotator cuff interval, the supraspinatus interspace. But if you would like to see specific structures, all you have to do is just to either do an extreme motion of that particular maneuver in the case of let's say the superior band complex, which I've, I've shown you, the only way to actually uh, show that is to do an extreme external rotation in order to see that band to be echogenic. If you don't, if you don't see that band, uh, you have not actually uh, externally rotated your shoulder enough. Now on the other hand, if you're dealing with a lot of impingement and you're looking at impingement uh, problems, then you can actually do a lot of abduction or internal external rotation, especially you're looking at some impingement maybe below your parochoid process or below your acromion process or even between your, uh, should I say, if you're looking at, although it's not really a reliable uh, way of doing it, especially for slap lesion, we don't, we don't really recommend that you use uh, ultrasound because you cannot, you cannot differentiate anything. You might have a clue that there is a problem that you wouldn't be able to see. Uh, you, as you change it from a linear to curvilinear curve, for example, you can still look at the anterior labrum and then go superiorly and try to find some pathologies there. And you can just kind of externally, internally rotate. And uh, to some extent, you can tilt your probe and then you can rock your probe, heel toe your probe. Uh, this may not require a lot of positioning, but at least this will help you ease out 
structures that you would like to see on a more specific uh, point of view. But otherwise, uh, you would not be able to see a lot uh, in addition to what we already have. Thank you very much, Dr. Jim. This was a great lecture. Thank you very much. So any more questions? So I'm really sorry that uh, we missed Dr. Ingrid today. I will try to communicate with her and find out uh, when she can be available. And I will tell her to uh, use Zoom because I think he's using, she's using Fox something or Safari, I think, instead of the Zoom. So uh, if there are no other questions, thank you so much for your time. Sorry for holding you too long. And uh, on uh, Thursday, this will be a unique lecture. Of, again, this is about dermatologic ultrasound. Uh, this, Dr. Zimina Wurtzman is a, in an expert in dermatologic ultrasound. Uh, we may not be able to use it, but it's always nice to learn at that technique using the BIVO, which is a 70 megahertz ultrasound. Uh, we may not even be able to use our own ultrasound, but at least we can view what is there to see when we use this kind of ultrasound uh, in, the, in the skin. So on Thursday, see you again. And thank you for your time. Thank you and uh, God bless. Thank you, everybody.